Sports here on Hawaii Football Now. Recapping what was a pretty special night in Manoa this past Saturday on Colt Brennan Tribute Night. Hawaii picks up win number four as they defeat New Mexico State. Got a big road trip to Logan, Utah. We got to get to as well as the Rainbow Warriors will hit the road for a matchup at Utah State, who is currently in first place in the Mountain Division. Jordan Helley, Hunter Hughes back with you. And Hunter, uh, for our opening drive segment here, I don't know if people had realized this or whatnot. Hopefully not, because that means, uh, you know, maybe we got a little chemistry here. Uh, I met you for the first time in person. Uh, we have obviously had a, a handful of conversations, both, uh, you know, while recording this podcast and, and off air as well. But uh, my man, it was a pleasure to see you. Uh, at the University of Hawaii football game over at Ching this past weekend. It's kind of funny. You played with a lot of Baldwin and Maui guys uh, that I know yep. uh, either coached them, played with them, uh, like classmates of my younger brother. Uh, it's funny how many connections there are. And uh, Hawaii, still a small place. Oh, very much. Uh, and again, yeah, it's a pleasure for me as well, man, getting to meet you in person. Uh, meeting other than just this version of uh, Jordan Helen, <laughs> we, we got the, the, the full article. Um, and yeah, it's kind of the uniqueness of uh, the technological age that we're in, that we're able to piece this together while you're over on Maui, I'm over on Oahu, of course. Uh, but uh, good to be in person for a UH game, man, finally. Um, that was great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun for us. And this is kind of a funny week because uh, I, I'm not in my usual location. I'm up in Seattle, uh, took a little getaway, runaway, went to the Seahawks game last night, going to get a chance to go to the Kraken game tonight. Uh, so making it into a little Seattle sports getaway. And uh, Hunter's like chilling in Kalihi Valley uh, with the right. roosters, with the chickens. Uh, we're doing this early in the morning. So uh, if you hear a little bit of uh, ambient noise, we're just trying to give you the full, uh, full Hawaii experience with some of that natural noise in the soundtrack. Right. <laughs> oh and man so, and so no, no, uh, nothing but nothing but the best from up here in uh, Kalihi Valley for all oh, you yeah. listening and uh yeah this is a local podcast uh that's right Matthew we gotta get Kalihi Valley today we gotta give the people what they want right then uh, a lot of Hawaii fans getting what they want this past Saturday night with a 48-34 victory over New Mexico State. Rainbow Warriors move back to 500, now 4-4 four and four on the season with five games remaining. Again, seven, sort of the magic number to get to bowl eligibility. Um, but Saturday night, I thought, was just about so much more than the game. And we will get to some of the game details uh, here in just a second. But it was Colt Brennan Tribute Night. Uh, it was the first game on campus with fans in attendance, even if it was just 1,000. Um, and again, we'll, we'll get to some of the, the on the field stuff. Cause obviously we had a couple of really stand or more than a couple of really standout performances for the university of Hawaii. Uh, but for me, the re real story was off the field and it was, it was such a surreal environment. You know, we had, you and I had both been to some games on campus prior to them allowing fans. Uh, I was there for the first Portland state game where like, they didn't even really have ambient noise piped in or anything like that yeah. like touchdowns yeah. were being had and the only sound you heard were the sideline cheering and it, it was just so odd it felt like a scrimmage and then they sort of started to work in some of the the game day atmosphere type stuff as they got ready for fans to return um but even with just a thousand people there like the buzz was palpable and yeah. then everything that went along with honoring Colt, um it felt it felt different. Like there was some, there was a chicken skin element to it all. Um, but I, I was just kind of curious, Hunter, what, what was your sense of, of the atmosphere and everything that went on um, last Saturday night? Yeah. Um, definitely special to first time we've got fans on campus in Manoa for a university of Hawaii regulation football game. Uh, pretty, pretty awesome. Just to that in general, uh, makes me really stoked that that's kind of where we're at. Um, obviously, we, we would always want more. Uh, it was it was interesting. The uh, we had a few fanatics uh, out there, like the crazy UH fans with costumes and stuff. And uh, um, yeah, if they wanted uh, an opinion to be known, whether it be to a ref or a play call. Just like at Aloha Stadium, uh, you you can hear those guys, and even more so with uh, only the thousand um, uh, fans in in, uh, in attendance. And so that was kind of unique. Uh, two weeks ago, or I guess this would longer with the bye week, the last home game against Fresno, um, the band would take up the east stands over on the the far side of the field by uh, the baseball complex. Um, 
but they allowed the uh, uh, the away team, uh, New Mexico State's fans, to kind of occupy that, which I counted. I think I counted like 24 people over there. So they had an entire section devoted to um, New Mexico State, and the poor band, <laughs> poor band, man, had to kind of sit over in the corner. Um, they're like, yeah, yeah, you just go over there, guys. Um, but um, the band let their presence be known. I think uh, just in proximity, closer to some of those instruments, like you felt it in your chest a little bit more. Um, <laughs> and then additionally, what you were talking about with, with Colt, uh, there were a few moments watching some of those montages, some of the storytelling of everything that went down. And of course, all of us know the story, but there in that moment, especially for me, whenever they showed uh, the press conference for him, whenever he was... Uh, trying to decide if he was going to go to the NFL or come back for one more season and watching like, I mean, I've got chicken skin right now watching him get choked up in that interview or that, that press conference saying that he's going to come back to Hawaii, man, it just, it's awesome. It, it doesn't get any better in my opinion, like to see guaranteed money right, right there in front of your face. But love of Hawaii, love of your team, love of this island, love of this place, weighing heavier than that. Uh, and for like a, another Howley boy from the mainland, like I'm, I'm not from here. Like I just, uh, my, my local friends, whenever they find out that I'm still around, I, I know that that meant the world to um, the community of Hawaii back when he did that and get to feel that a little bit. Um, during that kind of montage storytelling uh, segment of the night was was really special. Yeah, it, it's hard to believe, you know, that's that's 14, 15 years ago, basically, when when Colt made that decision and then took us on an even wilder ride his senior year when Hawaii went on that 12 and 0 run, got to the Sugar Bowl and all of that. And so, I mean, you're, you're talking about kids now who are basically at the beginning of high school who weren't even alive back then, right? And and I don't know if it's even possible, even with all the video we have and, and you know, of the press conference, of the games, of, of fan reaction, all that kind of stuff. But if you took like a 14-year-old kid and tried to explain to them what the University of Hawaii football program, the heights that it found that year, how good Colt Brennan was, the fact that he was a Heisman Trophy finalist and all of that. Like, I, I think people would look at you like you're crazy. And that's no knock on where the program is now or anything like that and, and nothing. But it's just, it's just unfathomable where that team and where he was and how bright his star was uh, when he was quarterbacking the University of Hawaii. And earlier... This summer, they announced that he was going to be part of the latest class into the Hawaii Hall or the Ring of Honor, um, and that will that will be another ceremony for another time. Uh, as he, you know, Amber Kaufman, Robert Kekala, among some of the inductees coming up this year. Uh, but one thing we did not know, and, and Colt's fan family was in attendance. It was it was well known that it was going to be Colt Brennan Tribute Night. Um, but at halftime, when they did a little bit of a ceremony, um, more in length and announced that they were going to retire the number 15. Um, I didn't know what was happening. Uh, I'm sitting next to Nate Ilawa, uh, former Hawaii great running back, obviously former roommate of Colt Brennan, uh, as we're doing um, the halftime show for Spectrum Television. And we didn't know. And we're getting choked up, man. And we're, we're wow. you know, we're supposed to like do stuff on, on TV and Nate's next to me, man. And he's trying not to, he's holding back tears. Um, and I found myself, you know, <laughs> holding back some tears and it was yeah. just it was heavy you know and and it was it was one of those where one it, it's it's more than warranted it's one of those reminders oh, yeah. i think and this isn't this isn't necessarily a an indictment or i'm not trying to to blame anybody but it's just one of those reminders that sometimes you know we we don't have to wait until these guys are gone right we don't have to wait yeah. until some of these all-time greats are no longer with us to have some of these honors. And again, that, that I want to make that clear. Like this is in no way I'm not blaming UH administrators right. or anything like that. Like, you know, we, nobody's at blame here. It's just, it's just one of those reminders. It's like, man, you know, we, it would have been cool if Colt Colt was there, right. To see his number retired. The fact that nobody ever again in this program's history will wear number 15. And I think that's how it should be. Um, and you know, maybe just a little, a little, uh, 
side recommendation. Like once they once they can get to 100 percent capacity, we should do something again. Like we can we can honor Colt more than once. I think he was he was that impressive and, and obviously that impactful. But yeah, that that moment when they retired his number, um, I think there were a lot of people in attendance and, and just kind of spoke to the impact, right? Of you didn't have to meet him personally, like, but he everybody in the state, even beyond fans on the yeah. mainland, like you felt like you knew him. He was so accessible, he was so giving of his time. Um and it, it was just incredible. And, and yeah, that, the, the moment, crowd, that moment, that moment was, was kind something. of had a the crowd kind of had like a an unscripted standing ovation at that point. The minute that they announced that the jersey would be retired, I mean, I immediately stood up and then a bunch of other people started standing up around me. Um, it's just what you're supposed to do. Like, and I, I couldn't agree anymore. What why why do legends have to depart for us to appreciate, appreciate them appropriately. And I, I think he knew, you know, in the, the times that I've talked with Cole Colt and he came down to, um, uh, to practice and different things like that. You can tell just by the way that uh, current players look at you, uh, the mantle that you carried. Um, and so he understood the assignment um, I know that's kind of a social media thing right now, but Colt did it the right way. Um, and uh, really adopting this place as his own. Um, and then, of course, unparalleled on the field prowess. I mean, man, some I, I, I was standing next to uh, Sean Withy Allen, who's now uh, the chaplain for University of Hawaii and former uh, player back in the early 2000s with Rolo and Stussman, those guys. Um, we were just watching some of those throws as two former quarterbacks won. My goodness, my guy could sling it. Some of the spots that he put those footballs were unbelievable. Um, and the courage to throw some of those balls were, um, I think, just <laughs> adds to all of the reason why we we love Colt Brennan as well. Yeah, there there was uh... – I mean, he just embodied his his mesh with Hawaii was was so great, right? He had this humility to him, but as you mentioned on the field, there was this fearlessness, right? There was like, hey, look, I'm I'm gonna go out there and shred you, you know, uh, helmet off and whatnot. There's this very laid back, chill guy. Felt the, f you know, filled the island vibe. Listening to Bob uh, Marley, Bob Marley, and all of that kind of stuff. But on the yeah. field, my guy was he was a bit of an assassin out there, and, and he he wasn't yeah. taking any you know, anything from all, all, any the other teams. And I think that just embodies Hawaii so much, right? It's like when the look, visor right? came on a different oh, person was different born. dude. And, 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 you know, I, I I've shared the story before, but it's so like, I was a, a junior and senior, his junior and seniors um, in college, I was a high school junior mm -hmm. and senior. And so it's so funny because like every kid playing high school football in Hawaii, like they're putting on visors, like they had no business. Like I remember trying to throw like him because like whatever I'm doing, I can't throw the football like him. So why, maybe I need to drop my arm down a little bit and start slinging it sidearm. And it's like, that was worse, but you know, it's like, it's like, it was like, he was the perfect quarterback. And so everybody who was playing football, I'm sure pop Warner kids, high school kids, uh, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to run routes like Rice Mullen. They're trying to, you know, throw the yeah. football like Cole. It was just, yeah, and it was it was a special night. It, it really was, and, and I think you know, do it again, run it back. It, it was, it was really cool stuff. And then you got the the fact that you had some fans in the stands, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. You know, they it it looked a little more sparse than I maybe thought. And then I don't, you know, that's just me because there's look one ninth of the, of the capacity, right? So it's going to yeah, look yeah. a little sparse. But I tell you what, the the, the sounds right? The, the, the cheering, the volume level, all of that. I, I was so impressed. I really was right. And then you got some of that game day experience, some of the of game course. day atmospheres, right? Like they were doing like chihus after first downs, you're playing the one love for the final 15, the last quarter, right? Sort of in honor of Colt. And they, they asked everybody to put up the cell phone lights. Like, is that, that might be a thing going forward, right? Like Wisconsin's jumping around between quarters, Oregon's playing shout. Like is uh, maybe, maybe Hawaii home games. It's going to be one love, right? Which, which would. And, and some of the, um, some of the classic Aloha stadium traditions, uh, you know, were returned in some way like that. They, they always have the, uh, the fan come out and throw into the, uh, the target. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different. Uh, I want to tell this story. It's so good. Uh, they, they brought a fan onto the field and he had two throws to, to throw it to Greg Salas from the 50. So you got two throws to get it to Greg Salas. Um, 
first throw, he, I, I think he threw it maybe like 35 yards, something like that. Beautiful duck floating through the air, um, got down there. And then the next throw, I think he was from like the 15 or something like that. And he, they announced that if he threw it to Greg, Greg can't move. This fan will win, um, raising canes for a year. And, uh, he, he throws the ball and Greg being the competitor that he is kept his feet planted, but full laid out like parallel, like a stiff board falling to the ground and caught the ball for the guy, but fully laid out. Greg Salas dove for the guy to catch the ball. Um, and, uh, and the place erupted, erupted. So man, it was fantastic. I, so, so fun. I love that, right? And that that's what it that's what it is. Fans back in the stands, former players, former greats for this program around the field, right? Interacting with these fans. Like that is yeah. it's just it was it was so refreshing to be back in an environment like that. And I know there's a lot of people probably, you know, tuning into this podcast, whether watching the video or, uh, you know, driving around listening to this, you're like, I didn't get a goal yet, right? And I just cannot wait until they yeah. they, they, they let um, as many people into that place as, as it fits because it was it was really terrific. It, it really was. And, and uh, it, it even exceeded, uh, you know, the first time I went down there, I was thoroughly impressed with what they did in terms of constructing that place, exceeded totally. my expectations. And even with a thousand fans there, I think it, it it exceeded my expectations again, like just the experience with that minimal amount of people. Um, and I can only imagine once they get to 50 percent capacity or 9000 or even build that thing out. Like I, I know a little stadium and that, you know, footprint has a lot of history. But I'm telling you, there is it feels yeah. right to have the football team playing on campus. And I don't know where the plans are currently for the new Aloha Stadium um, district, but it's if they can make it work on campus going forward forever, I I, I think I think that's do. kind of where my vote is. Oh, me too. I think anybody uh I really want, wonder who the voting committee is, you know, to bring it back to a law <laughs> stadium because I talked to multiple season ticket holders um, at my job. Uh, they're members at the golf course that I work at. Um, and then just people uh, in the community and they're all huge fans of bringing it back to campus. Um, I think for uh, the reason you're a season ticket holder, not only your support of the program, but a lot of them are alumni. They want to be reminded of what it was like to be back on campus again, bring their kids, their grandkids back. Hey, this was the environment that, that I was a part of, that I was in. And I would love to bring you to be a part of it now too. Um, that's why fan bases are so strong on the mainland because you're back on campus, the site of where all these memories happen. Um, and I, I, I think it's a stronger narrative for our program you know, I, I was even talking with uh, with Muta, uh, the uh, the basketball player for uh, for University of Hawaii right now, um, at the game, and we were talking about imagine a nationally televised game and they show a drone shot just over the southeast corner of our end zone as Diamond Head right there. It's just um, it's a better it's a better situation for us in my opinion. Um, once they've determined a law stadium is no longer an option. And uh, yeah, we, we, we get some more fans in there, keep some of those traditions that we had in the stadium. It could be a lot of fun. It has been fun so far. Yeah, it really has. And, and yeah, I'm with you. The, the diamond head over one end zone, the sun setting behind stand sheriff center out the other end zone. Like it's, awesome. it's, it's a sight to behold full disclosure. I've only gone to a game with nobody in attendance and with a thousand people in attendance. That's right. And same, if they would be, <laughs> and so the parking situation has been great so far, the traffic, not bad. Um, when there's more than 10,000 people in that, in that, you know, lower campus and, and we're, we're all pulling our hair out because you can't get out of the, the, you know, the campus road or whatnot, maybe I'll have a different opinion, but as of now, it's been great. Uh, and, and I'm sure we can figure out the parking thing and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, when it comes down to tailgating, all that stuff, but, uh, I do acknowledge that the parking and traffic has not been an issue just yet, but we're, we're just scratching the surface. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, parking is a nightmare in Manoa as a student, uh, already. So yeah, that, that, that stadium, at capacity that that'll be uh, a hurdle 
but I don't think it's the sole hurdle to keep us from doing what I think is uh, needing to happen for the program and keeping that on campus. So um, I've said it many times. I'll, I'll say it here on the podcast. I think one interesting option would be opening up upper campus, some of the lawns, some of the uh, the open spaces, because University of Hawaii Manoa's campus is actually pretty big. Um, I think there might be some areas that we could utilize similar to kind of a um, an on-campus tailgate experience that you would get on the mainland. Um, you could still get that kind of outside um, feel that we love to experience at Aloha Stadium on campus and then just walk down the field to the game. I mean, walk down the hill to the game. Uh, it could be a really cool uh, thing uh, at University of Hawaii Manoa. So um, I don't know, Jordan, I, I'm optimistic, man. It was cool. Yeah, see, seeing it with fans, it, it, the place came to life and I think got people thinking about the possibilities going forward and the potential of that facility um, once it gets out to full capacity and even a build out beyond where it currently sits. It's a 9,000 seat capacity. Mm. So that'll do it for us uh, here in the first half. Uh, again, Colt Brennan, uh, number retired, long overdue. We love it. Um, we will get into the details of this New Mexico State win coming up after the break. We'll preview the Utah State game as well. But uh, we felt it only appropriate to start the podcast right. with a little bit of the off the field, uh, the fans in attendance, Colt Knight, and all that came with it. But uh, we'll step away. We'll come right back. A little more Hawaii football now. A lot more football to get into. This is Hawaii football now from ESPN Honolulu. All right, second half time here on HFN. Jordan Hunter back with you. Let's get into some of the details of Hawaii's fourth win here in 2021. UH 48, New Mexico State 34 in a game that was fairly competitive. I think compelling, at least from a competition standpoint. Uh, Hawaii still down Chevin Cordero. They were down Day Day Hunter as well. So you're basically down your starting backfield. Uh, and yet that offensive line continues to roll. And it was Diedrich Parson who took the, uh, took the mantle, took the baton, and ran with it. You know, pun intended. 25 carries, 161 yards, three touchdowns. He also led the team in receptions with six catches for 54 yards. Calvin Turner adds 94 yards on the ground, in large part because of the 75-yard touchdown run. Hawaii had three plays of over 75 yards, two of them coming on the defensive side of the football. We'll get to that in just a second. Calvin also added five catches for 30 yards. Braden Shager... Forced to throw early, could have been an interception. It wasn't. Other than that, I thought he was really, really solid and really did his job and, and utilized uh, the passing game off of what they were able to do on the ground. 25 of 29, 219 yards, no touchdowns, no picks either coming off of that four interception game on the road against Nevada. Uh, early impressions for you, Hunter, after this latest victory? Uh, we are a running football team. Man, we, we've said it for a couple of weeks now. Uh, I remember talking with the sports animals uh, and coach on, uh, on that show just a few weeks back of kind of what we've touched on uh, this podcast throughout the whole year. Whatever our identity is, just stick to it. And um, it, it, it was almost as if this game, those of us that have really been paying attention to the team, okay, we know that we're a running team. Let's go out and dominate in that fashion again. And we did it with um, maybe not our, our best running back out there. Um, shout out to Dedrick Parson, man. Um, phenomenal effort by him. Uh, first year up at the, uh, div the division one level as well, uh, transferred over from Howard university and uh, talking from some of the guys on the team. We knew that he was kind of a, a truck, kind of a, a fullback style of a running back, but he showed some speed, Jordan. Uh, I saw some, uh, some breakaway speed from him multiple times in that game. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, our offensive line is proving to be one of our strongest units out there. Uh, really impressed with them. Uh, defense played fantastic. Corey Bathley, of course, did his thing again, had a pick six. Um, also, when was the last time you saw two pick sixes? in the same game from, from one team. I, I, I can't recall uh, that that's a very rare feat. Uh, Coach Withy Allen and I were talking about that on the sideline. Uh, pretty unique there. And then on top of that, kind of going back to the, uh, the run first style of our offense, we kind of let that dictate the passing game. 
never really made Brandon Shager push the ball down the field. Uh, it saw a lot more out routes, a lot more screens, a lot more uh, short, quick routes, and his accuracy uh, proves it. Twenty-five for twenty-nine, man. That's uh, that's a pretty good day at the office if you're a quarterback. So, um, yeah, didn't necessarily find the end zone, but took care of the football. And uh, um, yeah, it was a it was a good night overall. I would have to say. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I thought the way that Hawaii sort of built off of the run in terms of the passing game w- was nice to see. And and as you pointed out, the identity has proved to be, and I think could, should continue to be a ground and pound offense that, you know, you've got a, a couple of quarterbacks that have proven over the course of their career to have the ability to be accurate and sort of spray the ball around the field. I know that's been, you know, some mixed success over the course of, you know, the, the season for both Chevin Cordero and, and Braden Shager. But I, I think back to, you know, that first start against Fresno state where they were throwing deep ball after deep ball, after deep ball, you know, to, to minimal success. And we really didn't see that here in this ball game, as you pointed out, they, they, they looked to the quick game, right? A, a lot of get the ball out of your hand type throws. Dick Martiner had four catches, 81 yards, Jared smart, four catches, 45 yards. Shager completed 25 passes. As we've pointed out, eight different guys, eight different guys caught the football. And so they were spreading things around. It wasn't as predictable. I think as we have seen in the past from, from the, the offensive attack through the air. Uh, and it was, it was nice to see, right. And they end up putting basically 34 points on the board because ar- arguably the difference in the ball game outside of Parson and that offensive line were those two pick sixes by yeah. Corey Bethley and Darius Musa, both of them eight plus tackles. Corey Bethley had a sack and two quarterback hits as well. That guy is all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, put them up pretty big with his pick six in the second quarter. He is the Mountain West Defensive Player of the Week again, uh, as that was just announced on Monday. Um, but this defense, they they when they force turnovers, they 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 are at a different level, and and obviously. You know, maybe not a six turnover performance like Fresno State, but if you can cash that into points, whether it's short fields or just heck running it back yourself, um, it is a nice compliment to what this rushing attack on offense can do. Totally, yeah. And uh, I, um, I, 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 for for the beginning of this season, it looked like we were having a long time figuring out how we were going to incorporate the pass and. For the majority of the Hawaii fan base out there, whenever we see a cover two team like New Mexico State not really pressuring the quarterback a whole lot, I think we are kind of licking our chops going, why are we not throwing the football more on these guys? But this is a different Hawaii football team. It's coached differently. It's commanded differently. Um, and our skill set is a little bit different. So I, I'm, I'm thankful that we're kind of settling into who we are as a squad. Um, and uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's definitely good things to be, um, to be noticed here with this football team. I, I love how they seem to have a really strong unity being down there on the sideline, uh, feeling that from the guys. Um, the, the discipline is there. Um, there are a few um, aspects of, of the ball that definitely need to be improved. We had another turnover on special teams. Um, I don't know what that running total is on the year right now, but uh, one on the year is unacceptable. So I, I think if we have any chance moving forward in the rest of our season against uh, some very strong Mountain West teams, that cannot happen any longer. That, that screw needs to be tightened because um, we, we cannot afford to give the football up uh, in uh, kind of possession changing uh, situations. We, we have to be excellent there. So um, that's one thing that I'm, I'm really looking at uh, coming in the last couple games of the season, Jordan. No, I think that's fair to point out, right? And it's a, a team in New Mexico State that probably isn't better than four of the last five teams coming up, right? You can make the argument about UNLV, who is still winless, but has been very competitive uh, in a lot of their games, particularly in conference play. And so the, the, the level is going back, right back up with the trip to Utah State, right? And the, the other thing I think that 
continues to be a trend. Uh, Hawaii ran it for 7.3 yards per carry, but New Mexico State on the other side, Jawan Price was really good, 159 yards, two touchdowns on the ground. New Mexico State actually averaged 7.6 yards per carry. Uh, in the ball game, and so they they ran it just as effectively as Hawaii did at times. Um, you know, as as we pointed out, the the Muasau and Bethley pick sixes were a huge determining factor in this ball game. Uh, Jonah Johnson, their their big sturdy quarterback for New Mexico State, just 228 yards through the air, but he also ran for two touchdowns and 84 yards on the ground. And so that that is something that they are going to need to clean up for sure as we sort of transition things to Utah State and look at the road trip to Logan, Utah, which is never an easy road trip, right? You're going into the mountain time zone. You're going up to elevation. Uh, it is always a little dicey what the weather is going to be like in October, late October up in the mountains. And so just, you know, all things considered, look, this, as we pointed out, they're five and two overall. They got a win at Washington state. They're three and one in the mountain West mountain division, which puts them in first place on that side of the ledger in the mountain West conference. So with all that, even still being considered just how tough of a road trip is it when you got to go that far and play in that time zone? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, that this is uh, the, the real girth of our schedule, both uh, who we're playing, but also schedule wise uh, in terms of uh, travel for university of Hawaii, we travel more than any team in the entire country. Uh, your conditioning is really put into the test uh, your nutrition and then with all of that, uh, your mental health, because you're you're halfway through the season at this point. Uh, if you've gotten this far um, as a starter without any serious nicks or bruises or anything more substantial as a football player, you're doing pretty well. So just uh, having been there, th there's a lot of guys, even though they may not be on the injury list, they're in the training room right now. They've... Um, they, they, they each have their own stuff going on. And uh, whenever you travel up in the mountains, it's a little bit colder. The air's a little thinner. You got to uh, take a little bit longer to catch your breath. Uh, there, there's, there's always something uh, whenever you're playing up in, uh, in Logan. Uh, luckily, it looks, looks to be, at least at, at this point on Tuesday, the forecast looks halfway decent, uh, maybe a low of 37 degrees, which isn't too crazy, but... Uh, Again, if that goes down five or six degrees and we get some moisture in the air, snow could be happening. So, uh, I mean, that, that can change the blink of an eye when you're up in the mountains. So you got to be resilient. You got to be uh, one that rolls with the punches, but that just comes to the territory when you are a University of Hawaii football player, that, that warrior ethos. There, there's no excuses. Let's, let's go out and get it. So, um, but yeah, I don't know, Jordan, their, their work's going to be cut out uh, looking at what uh, Utah State is bringing this year. Yeah, and, and you throw all those elements on the table and then the fact that they are a solid football team here. And the one thing in theory, you would think, right, a Hawaii rushing attack, that should travel well, right? It's something that you can pack and take on the road with you and, and play that physical brand of football no matter what the weather conditions are. Utah State coming off of a two-point win against Colorado State last weekend, 26-24 over the Rams. Logan Bonner is the guy that leads things, 13 passing touchdowns in seven games. He's completing about 59% or so of his passes. Devin Tompkins is like by far their leading receiver when it comes to receptions, yards, production, and all that stuff. He's basically got half of Bonner's 13 touchdowns. He's caught six of them. Uh, they run the ball decently effective. 160 yards or so per game. Calvin Tyler Jr., not Calvin Turner Jr., but Calvin yeah. Tyler Jr. Uh, accounts for basically half of that production at 79 yards per game. He's also the only guy on the team with multiple touchdown rushes, four of the team's six. And so this is a team that, that runs the football more as balance as opposed to kind of the main focus of their offensive attack. And, and maybe that bodes well for a Hawaii defense that has been more susceptible against the run than anything else. And it's a team that, you know, isn't scoring lights out like we see some of the other teams in the Mountain West Conference. They're averaging about 28 points a game. They also give up right at 28 points a game. And so if the game is in the 20s, I think Hawaii's got a decent chance here. That, that sort of fits into the profile of this team where I know they just put up 48 points, but that's not necessarily something we've come to expect week in and week out. And so if, the, if this game is in the mid-20s or so, that, that might be at the pace where Hawaii could hang around here and, and really make some noise. Yeah, I think if the defense uh, keeps them to that 
uh, to that point margin, I feel like they will have done their job. Um, in the tough games this year, our defense has bailed us out or at least given us an opportunity to win. Um, in the Fresno State game, we held on to the football and won that turnover margin by a handsome number. Um, our defense did a great job in the first half, I felt, against Nevada Reno. Uh, but then our offense did not get it done in the second half. And so going up against good teams in you know these last five games, definitely against Utah State, San Diego State, and then going up against Wyoming uh, at the end of the year, uh, we're asking a lot of our defense. But then, like offense, it's time to rise up and do your thing. Um, not really sure what the situation is going to be with Shevin uh, coming into this game if he's going to be ready to go or not. Uh, with this now being the second, um, the, the second time that he's still on the bench uh, behind uh, um, Brendan Shager, but um, yeah, I, we're, we're needing to score points in the Mountain West. That's just the way it is. It's not going to be an SEC run. Uh, you know, battle in the trenches, 10 to seven game. That's just not the way the mountain West is designed. So um, uh, we're going to need to score points. If we're going to get it done against uh, in Logan. Yeah. And in health, as you pointed out, uh, probably a big factor to that equation as well. Chevron Cordero, Dede Hunter, and some others to go along with that. So Hawaii playing first place in the mountain division this week, current first place in the West division next week, San Diego state, although the Aztecs have a huge game against Fresno State coming up this weekend. So we'll see where the pecking order is. Fresno State 3-1, and one, San Diego State 3-0 and oh currently in conference play. And so you're looking at those two next games on the schedule, and then things lighten up a little bit, but it, it's always a little interesting when Hawaii and UNLV get together. That comes in three weeks' time, a trip to Vegas. You got Colorado State at home, final home game, and then Thanksgiving weekend, they close out the regular season with a trip to Laramie, Wyoming. And so... It is a schedule where Hawaii needs to go three and two the rest of the way to get to bowl eligibility. And we talked about this last week. They basically got to run the table if they've got a shot at getting into the Mountain West title game. And so with what the final three games present, you look at, okay, maybe two and one is pretty good there. So my question to you, Hunter, do yeah. they need to split these next two games, either a win at Utah State or a win at home against San Diego State? Look, two wins would be great but a minimum split to probably get to seven wins here by the end of the season? Um, absolutely. Uh, we have to go three and two to be bowl eligible. Um, one of these games, whether it be Utah State or San Diego State, a ranked San Diego State team, by the way, at home, uh, that's going to be that's going to be all that we can handle and more. So, um, yeah, we definitely got to split one of these games pick your poison that you got to go out and, and compete every every time you strap on your helmet but uh yeah if we're if we're still wanting if that's one of the goals of this team is to get to a bowl game looks like mountain west championship probably isn't going to happen um and just uh being honest i don't know if uh this this team necessarily deserves a chance to be a mountain west contender this year we've done some great things but uh to be in that top echelon in the Mountain West, uh, I don't know if our offense is capable of scoring uh, that 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 level of points that that requires us to be in that conversation. So I don't think we're quite there this year. But I definitely think that we could scrap together some um, some wins just from the the heart and dedication of our of our program and uh, kind of the unity of the team that's why those things are so important because when the going gets tough you can still win football games if you're uh playing as one so uh i think that's definitely still in the realm of possibility for us and um the season's not washed yet at all we've uh, we got to get it done i think this week more than san diego because uh san diego performs like a professional team whenever we play them they're, they're just level of discipline and um um yeah just situational great greatness is is apparent to every facet of the football yeah it's always a well-prepared team no matter who the head coach is even after this transition from rocky long over to brady hoke and and so yeah i'm, I'm with you look if if you don't win at least one of these next two games you're looking at a position where you've got to win out in the final three weeks of the regular season to get to that seven magic numbers so hopefully you know 
they get they keep the train rolling at Utah State, pick up a road win there. That would definitely put them very much in position to have a strong finish to the season, no doubt about that. All right, we'll kind of put the bull on this Utah State matchup coming up, and we will transition into a little overtime here as we close out another episode on Hawaii football now. Uh, my little uh, tidbit to end the, the season, uh, I just kind of wanted to, to mention Tua Tango Um, You know, I, I think with all of the trade rumors swirling once again with Deshaun Watson, which is just kind of mind-boggling to me with everything going on off the field when it comes to Deshaun, uh, Tua has kind of maybe quietly gone out and played two of his best games in a while, uh, you know, right? Completing 75% of his passes the last two weeks, six touchdowns, three interceptions, had a four touchdown performance against Atlanta, had his team in position to win both of those games in London against Jacksonville and then at home against Atlanta. And I look, those aren't world beaters. I think the concerns about Tua's ability to stay healthy are fair, I don't think he has necessarily lit the world on fire and you can talk about circumstance and all those kinds of stuff. You just, you got to get the job done. Right. Sure. But it's just nice to see him play well, particularly with everything swirling around off the field. And uh, I just want to give a little tip of the cap to Tua there. It's uh it's yeah, always a, a firestorm, right? Yeah. I mean, he's, 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 he's playing, he's playing well coming off of that injury and who knows where he's playing by the end of the season, Washington or Houston or Miami or maybe someplace else. We'll, 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 we'll wait and see. Wherever he lands, I hope it's not in Chicago. Stay as far away from there as possible. Jordan, yes. that's my overtime yes. segment right now. I'm about ready to jump teams. <laughs> okay, very rarely do we get nationally televised Bears games all the way out here in Hawaii. And, of course, we're playing, we're playing the GOAT. We're playing Tom Brady. We were going to have our work cut out for us in general. They should have mercy ruled that game. It was over at halftime. It was 35 to three at halftime. And very rarely am I so unimpressed with a game of my own team that I'm ready to turn the TV off. I put on like a, a, a rerun of, of golf. Like it, it was brutal. I had to change the channel. It was horrible. Um, we need a new coach. We need an all, a new offensive line. Uh, the Chicago Bears are in bad shape right now. So um, for the, uh, the faithful Chicago fans listening out there, we feel your pain, both me and Jordan. Yeah, that's, that's another thing Hunter and I have in common is a, um, is a sad fandom of the Chicago Bears, and it is, it is brutal. Yeah, that, that game was over, I could argue, like at the end of the first quarter, right? Was it 21 to nothing yeah. at the end of the first quarter? Yeah, so we've, we've gotten that game. Uh, another game that we had in Hawaii were about three weeks ago against the Browns. That was atrocious. Uh, and then the, the opening week game, uh, Sunday night against the Rams. That wasn't a whole lot better. I am with you. Uh, the Bears are bad, man, and poor Justin Fields. And so, I think, yes. I think if you're Tua, an NFC. If stay away. Team, yeah, if your team's in the NFC, you're entitled to an AFC team. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. And so I'm kind of uh, – I'm going through my options right now. I'm, I'm, I've entered the, uh, the AFC dating pool, if you will. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what other teams have to offer right now. I really like uh, uh, Baltimore. I really like what they're doing mm -hmm. over there. Um, Kansas City is kind of on the downward spiral right now. Um, and seeing the Raiders continue to win in spite of everything that's happened over there. Uh, so I'm entertaining some AFC options right now, Jordan, because it's not working out with Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, although there is another downtrodden fan base that may be putting their hand up if you want to stay sort of in that same region of the country as the Bears, those Bengals. Bengals. Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, they look pretty good. Uh, and they uh, just kind of took it to Baltimore yesterday or uh, on Sunday, I should say. And, yeah. uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see if they're uh, amongst the contenders with the likes of Baltimore, uh, maybe uh, an LA Chargers or, or Buffalo, perhaps. But uh, it'll be a lot of fun. We'll uh, we'll always have this little overtime segment for us to to squeeze in a couple of tidbits, maybe vent a little bit about our teams just absolutely being bad uh, as we did today. Uh, but as always, you can check us out on the ESPN Honolulu platforms, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, our podcast channel as well. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, and as always, we appreciate the support. Hunter, it's always been fun, man. Uh, I will see you probably in a couple of weeks um, at the next University of Hawaii home game. Bo's again coming up this weekend with a trip to Logan, Utah. Be sure to check in with uh, Bobby John and the guys on the call for that one as well. Hunter, have a good rest of your week, man. We'll catch everybody next time on Hawaii Football Now. 
You've been listening to Hawaii Football Now with Jordan Helley and Hunter Hughes, all from ESPN Honolulu.